Hi there. I really wanted to make a good first impression with all of you, so I brought a cookie. If you're in the front, perhaps you can tell that this is a fortune cookie. And if you're further back, allow me to provide an ocular enhancement. There we are. This is our ocular enhancement. Absolutely worth waiting for. Because you can tell just from that beautiful architectural shape that this is a designed object. And in fact, these were invented by the landscape architect behind the iconic Japanese tea garden right here in San Francisco. And there's more to it than just that beautiful shape. Let me show you. Catch. I recently got a fortune that I think is worth sharing. This, of course, being the opportune time to say thank you so much to the organization together. And to the other <laughs> I am humbled to share. And to you here in the audience, I want to point out that a special moment has just happened, and it was facilitated by a cookie. Honestly, not even a They're bland and they're crumbly, and yet a few words are enough to transform them into a shared experience. It might interest you to know that writing itself was invented by a designer. Thank you. This is a clay envelope used by our ancestors in the Middle East. You can think of this as something like a piggy bank, where you'd put trade tokens in it and smash it open to see what's inside. But once upon a time, a very clever designer realize that they could put markings on the outside to tell you what is in there. Today, we call this microcopy, but at the time, this was a revolution. And today, we're in the middle of another revolution built on exactly the same interaction pattern. There is a piece of writing, and it tells you what is on the other side. And I know right about now, you're wondering, who is this bozo pacing back and forth, speaking loudly about fortune cookies and archaeology at awards? Well, let me tell you. I'm Ben. I'm a product designer at Dropbox, and I love language. Give me the usual show of hands. Who here uses Dropbox? No, keep them up. Nine hundred and forty-seven. That's three more than I expected. What a beautiful crowd. For those of you who didn't raise your hands or did just to save me some embarrassment, Dropbox is a collaboration tool built around sharing things with other people. It happens to be distinguished by one of the great UX writing teams out there. I'm excited to see that someone from this team is among you in the audience. And before I was at Dropbox, I spent time in the publishing industry at places like Medium and Byliner, which I know most of you haven't heard of, but we won a Pulitzer Prize, and I think that's worth something even in this day and age. I've had the remarkable privilege of working with many of the best writers and editors in the world, and these collaborations have taught me the simple but profound lesson that every product has a voice. And I know that you think I'm being metaphorical when I say that, but I assure you, on the contrary, I mean it 100% literally. I mean that when you look at the words that are scribbled all over every app or website, not only do you see them with your eyes, you also hear them as if they were spoken. This voice is a figment of your imagination, but I would argue it's every bit as real as the fictive colors or motion on the screens in your pocket or the one right here behind me. This voice is an illusion created by your body's interaction with technology, and it's there for you to design. This idea really captivated me, so I burned through a bundle of books and I boiled my notes down to three simple principles that I found helpful in my work. I'm going to share them with you today in the hope that you find them helpful as well. Without further ado, our first is to be clear. Our second, be a friend. And our third is to be expressive. As stupidly simple as this may look, it stands in for a much bigger picture that is much more complicated and nuanced and worth thinking about. For one thing, they fit into a hierarchy of needs. Each layer here supports everything above it. So you can't have a conversation without clarity because then there's no point, there's no comprehension. And you can have a strong personality without social grace, but that's a surefire way to lose a friend. On the other hand, each layer amplifies what comes below. So when you take a clear statement and you use it in a supportive way, it really connects much better. And if you do it 
with the right personality at the right time, you can make it truly meaningful. Let's jump right in to be clear, because there is a lot to unpack. I'd like to start with a game. I'm going to share two quotes representing the real political views of two candidates in a national election. And I want to see who among you can guess who won and who lost based on their words alone. Ready? Here's A. I stand for a bold progressive internationalism that stands in stark contrast to the too often belligerent and myopic unilateralism of the current administration. And yes, I memorized that. And here's B. Let's go it alone. Show me your hands if you think A won. Someone, please, be brave. Maybe two of you. What about B? Few of you didn't vote, that's okay, this is an American election. <laughs> A was John Kerry, B, George W. Bush. Any students of history in this room can tell you that George Bush won this election. And I would argue that he understood exactly the kind of clarity that matters most for design. He understood that you need to make things easy or people will disengage. Let me illustrate this one more time. Instagram, incredibly popular app, and you seem like a bunch of incredibly popular people. I will personally buy a drink for anyone in this room who's read Instagram's terms of service. I figured this is a safe bet, I don't see any takers, because it takes 86 minutes to read. Your time is worth more than that. And I'd like to segue now into a study that I think is absolutely fascinating. A group of researchers at many of the top labs around the world wanted to see what happens when people read text silently to themselves. They put electrodes directly into people's brains, which is unusual and they had people read silently. What they found is that in addition to the things you might expect to see, there's a lot going on in places like your sensory motor cortex right here. Your brain is trying to figure out what to do with the muscles in your mouth and tongue, and it's suppressing the signal at the same time. And it turns out that things that are difficult to say out loud, like tongue twisters, actually take longer to read. Not only that, but we're prone to many of the same lexical errors as when we say it out loud. And I think that this points us towards a certain kind of, of insight here. Because as automatic as reading feels to us, it's actually not an automatic process. It is a lot of work. It's very active. And there's a specific type of clarity that you can master by making your writing easy to say. So please humor me. On the count of three, I'd like to show you a few words, and I'd like you to say them with me. Ready? One, two, three. Anemone. You can do better. I'll keep at this all day if I need to. On the count of three. One, two, anemone. Much better. Next one. One, two, three, isthmus. Beautiful. One last one. One, two, three, cryptocurrency. What these three words have in common is that they are difficult to say and they have no business being in your product. It also means that something like this can be ruled out as bad design pretty quickly. Book your free consultation today is too busy for a button. Don't get me wrong though, because I'm not trying to suggest that you need to speak to your user like they're a simpleton. Sometimes you need to express an idea and ideas are complicated. One of the miraculous things about your brain, though, is that you can handle a lot of complexity as long as it comes in a story. And there's a specific kind of clarity that I think we can learn by looking to folk tales and traditional storytelling techniques. And this is easier to show than tell, so I'd like to share a video of one of my favorite stories by Italo Calvino, and this will give me a chance to catch up on breathing. Enjoy. Late in life, the Emperor Charlemagne fell in love with a German girl. The barons at his court were extremely worried when they saw that the sovereign, wholly taken up with his amorous passion and unmindful of his regal dignity, was neglecting the affairs of state. When the girl suddenly died, the courtiers were greatly relieved, 
but not for long, because Charlemagne's love did not die with her. The emperor had the embalmed body carried to his bedchamber, where he refused to be parted from it. The Archbishop Turpin, alarmed at this macabre passion, suspected an enchantment and insisted on examining the corpse. Hidden under the dead girl's tongue, he found a ring with a precious stone set in it. As soon as the ring was in Turpin's hands, Charlemagne fell passionately in love with the Archbishop and hurriedly had the girl buried. In order to escape the embarrassing situation, Turpin flung the ring into Lake Constance. Charlemagne thereupon fell in love with the lake and would not leave its shores. This story, this story takes about a minute to tell. And for something so short, there's a lot of action. There are many plot points and it digs into some dark and truly complicated ideas about things like love, power, grief. It does all of this with a tight logical through line and there's something about it that feels absolutely lucid to me. I think part of this is that this story comes from a spoken tradition and it was once the case that the purpose of the written word was to capture the rhythm of the spoken one. You didn't understand a piece of text until you read it out loud maybe 15 times. I tried that exercise with this story and as I read it, the text broke apart into little chunks that look like the lyrics of a song. Each one of these is a unit of text that takes you from one place to the next. There's not a wasted word. And there's something musical about this. It has a beat. I'm not the only one to have picked up on this. Aaron Sorkin, who you might know, is the screenwriter behind The Social Network in The West Wing, writes all of his amazing dialogue to music for this very reason. There's something about this approach that just works with us. And Let's look at how this applies to take this attitude that a text should have a beat, a pulse, come alive. Let's look at design. Imagine for a moment that you're reading restaurant reviews and this thing pops up. You know right off the bat that something is important because there is a big red border. And not one, but two news crews in this illustration. And yet you've already given up trying to read the text. It has sentences like, well, we don't take a stand one way or the other when it comes to these news events, whatever. This text does not tell a story, and it's hard to follow. When I read the text 15 times, it broke apart to look like this for me, which is to say it does not have a pulse. Let's raise the stakes, though. You know what this is. This is what you see when you try to buy something in any given mobile app. There is a big, thirsty button yearning for your thumb's embrace. And directly below it, there's some chunk of text where the designer has made it as difficult to read by lowering the size and the opacity. Maybe that was you once. And whoever wrote it didn't do any favors either. Let me read the one in the middle. It says, payment will be charged for your iTunes account once trial period has ended or confirmation of purchase if you're now eligible for a trial. Account will be charged for renewal on the last day of the current period. Subscription automatically renews monthly unless auto renew is turned off at least 24 hours before the end of the current period. You can cancel at any time by going to account settings. Any unused portion of your free trial period if offered will be forfeited when you purchase a subscription where applicable. This, if you haven't noticed, is a story about what happens to your money. As a user, you deserve better. As a designer, the least you can do is make the font bigger and maybe a little bit more legible. When I was at Medium, I was also very fortunate to work with a head of legal who's previously a professor of literature, and he helped re rewrite a lot of our legal copy to read in accessible plain English. I'll give you a chance to read a sentence or two. I won't stop you. One of the things I also admire about Dropbox is that Dropbox has beautifully written terms with sentences like this. Our services let you share your stuff with others, so please think carefully about what you share. Do you hear that music? This is good design. Fundamentally, the user is there because they're trying to get something done, and when you make your writing easy to read and engage with, you make your product more usable. So let's recap, be clear. Our next principle is to be a friend. You already know that it feels good when a product smiles at you. We're social creatures after all. And I want to open up into another study that I found absolutely fascinating. A group of researchers 
wanted to see what happens when you tune into the voices in your head. They put people in an fMRI machine. You might know that as a brain scanner. And they, look, they let people really just tune into the voices in their head. And what they saw is that when you do this, when you listen to the voices, it looks an, it looks an awful lot like your brain is simulating an imaginary friend for you to talk to. And in childhood development, it turns out that you don't actually start speaking to yourself to solve problems until you're at the stage where you're thinking about the thoughts and feelings that other people around you might have. That's theory of mind. Some believe that your inner voices are actually an internalized conversation with other people around you in your young childhood. I think that there is a real, if maybe abstract sense, in which when you engage with the words in a product, you're actually speaking to an imaginary friend. And as the designer, you get to play that friend. You are an angel there to sit on the user's shoulder and guide them through a difficult action. This also means that there's more to being a friend than having a friendly tone. You are there for support. This takes me to another study that's absolutely fascinating. These researchers wanted to see how people coach themselves through the most difficult, the most difficult life journey any of us ever go through, public speaking. They had one group of people coach themselves as they usually do, which for most people is in the second person. So imagine saying to yourself, you've got this, or you need to be faster next time. The other half were told to do it in the first person. So imagine saying to yourself, I've got this, or I need to be faster next time. And what do you think they found? Don't answer, I'll tell you. They found that people who coached themselves in the first person felt like they did worse and spent more time dwelling on their mistakes. There's a simple takeaway. As a rule of thumb, engage your reader in the second person. You. 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 This also means that every interaction is an invitation to a conversation. And if you want to start a good one with me, I highly recommend that you use a pun. This is from Warby Parker's glasses case. And you need to be smart about this, though. So there are many ways to mess this up. Imagine someone running up to you in a business suit and saying, what do you want to talk about? It's not so much how you start a conversation as how you try to end an uncomfortable silence. And between you and me, it doesn't work. Or here, imagine it's a hot day, so you crack open a crispy libation to quench your monstrous thirst. And you're told, we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Albert Einstein is telling you that you're caught in a vicious cycle of your own stupidity. Or here, imagine that a coworker has just shared a file with you, and you're told you were not invited to this organization. <laughs> Don't say things you wouldn't say in real life. Or here, imagine that you're in a car accident. Adrenaline is rushing through your veins. You hear your heart in your ear. You think you're okay, but you're not sure. You step out and you get your phone to look up your insurance information. You fumble your password under the pressure, understandably so. And this app tells you every mistake you've made since third grade. This is not good design. On the other hand, be polite. Medium occasionally needs to interrupt readers, as any big website does. And when I was there, my team found that when you say something like, pardon the interruption, it genuinely softens the blow. And people reacted very positively to this. I think what this taps into is that politeness is incredibly rare and therefore valuable on the internet. Words like thanks are tragically underused. And I'm going to give you a little piece of homework right now. I want you to go home, wherever home is for you at the end of this conference, log on to the internet, and please say thank you to someone for me. On that note, be clear, be a friend. And our third and last principle is to be expressive. You can't help but respect a product that knows exactly who it is. And it's not uncommon that there is some other layer of meaning that you want to convey without saying it outright. Your voice is an expressive instrument, and you should learn how to play it. Take this text, why hello. I want you to imagine it being read out loud by Scarlett Johansson. Now come back to the text. Relax your mind for just a moment. 
Now imagine it being read by Samuel L. Jackson. The voices that people speak with are incredibly different, and these are qualitatively different experiences. One group of researchers actually figured out that your beliefs about the speaker will change the way that you read. If you're imagining a fast talker, you'll actually read more quickly. Let's look at some examples. I really admire Spotify here. What they do is very subtle. They say, inspired by your recent listening. Inspired. Most apps would say based on. Depending on the time of day, it might become something like Monday Night Mood or you can do it. And they convey the personality of someone who cares what music you listen to. They're passionate. Let's look at two of their competitors. These apps are fine, they're well designed, but these are also robots and they don't know what music is. And think about context as well, because you need to choose something that fits in and feels appropriate. But this is not an excuse to be bland. So take this text, follow the recommended mission in order to progress and get more rewards. Someone wants us to believe that this was said by Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, the protector of the Union, dead for 154 years. It needs to make sense. I want to spend a moment talking about Dropbox, because as far as I know, Dropbox is not based on any specific person as a reference point, but it nevertheless has a very distinctive brand voice, and it manifests in a lot of interesting ways. It's sort of wild and exuberant and joyful and playful. It's like a puppy and a rainbow had a child. It's really compelling. And one of the key tools for this is typography. Because you can make any given typeface speak more loudly or softly or change tone by playing with things like the tracking, the size, the opacity. And Sharp is responsive, which gives us designers this incredible, elastic, bouncy, expressive range. It means that in one moment, we can speak like this with sort of a visually playful tone, and as I read it, a lot of unresolved tension. And a moment later, the same voice is speaking to you like this. The choice of words, of course, matters a fair bit. That's why we get moments like this when you authenticate your identity. Yep, that's you. Or during onboarding, you might get something like, fetch docs fast, adorable. And of course, in the paper doc, this is a fragile creative moment when you're getting started. It's easy to be intimidated by that blank screen. The default text is there to guide you along. Name your masterpiece, allow your brilliance to shine forth. When you start a new doc, you might get something like, give me a name, now write something brilliant, optional. Or, I love this one, time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. On that note, let me spend just a brief moment talking about why this matters. Because in design, it is often the smallest of details that makes the biggest difference. And we recently learned that 87 million people, maybe some of you in this very room, had intimate personal information exposed. And every single one of you agreed to let this happen. There's a lot of factors that play into an event like this, but one that we cannot overlook is that there were specific design decisions made that did not prioritize clarity or the user's interest. That's not unusual for us, and yet this is why it matters to have principles because principles are there to remind us what we owe the people we design for. Let's come back to ours. Be clear. Tell your reader what they need to hear. Be a friend. Help your reader accomplish their goals. And be expressive. Give your reader something meaningful. We have a lot of designing to do, and words are the most powerful tools that we have. Use them well. Thank you.